Welcome to the fifth class of the Niche Content Crash Course. Today we're going to be learning about informational content writing. Informational content is basically any kind of an article with the intended purpose to teach something. This could be to answer questions somebody may have about a subject. It could be to teach them how to do an activity, how to create something. It could simply be fact-based type of information on a certain subject. Ultimately, it really doesn't matter what this page is about as long as it is not targeting a product specifically and not all about a product. And as long as it's not one of the primary home or category pages of your website, then chances are it's going to be an informational page. Now these pages can be used on a website itself. They can also be used for things like educational ebook guides or the transcript for some kind of educational video perhaps. So today we're not only going to be learning about how to create and write these pages, we're also going to be learning about the purpose of these pages, how we should structure and organize them to get the best results as far as attracting search engine traffic and being able to convert that traffic into a sale or whatever else our website goal may be. Another key thing about this informational content, the reason why you want it to be there, because a lot of marketers do avoid informational content. They think I'm only going to target the buying keyword phrases and I'm going to ignore all this informational based stuff. Well, I see it in a different way and I know that it works because this is something that I've been using for many years and that is the informational content typically leads to other things. After people have learned about a particular subject, they are often primed to perhaps buy a product. But if nothing else, when you give good information and it doesn't really appear as though the purpose of doing that is to try to make a sale, you're building trust with your readers. And that makes them a lot more likely to end up buying from you later. Since each of these articles will usually target a very well-defined subject, this also allows you to basically predict what your readers are going to want next. And this in turn can simply lead to more sales. We'll talk about this in a little more detail here in just a minute. As part of this writing demonstration that I'm going to do at the end of today's class, we are also going to have a writing blueprint. This is going to be the third blueprint for this particular series. And this blueprint is something that you should be using with your informational articles. So with that said, I want to first talk about what is essentially the purpose for this kind of content. I mentioned before that you're looking to build trust and loyalty with your readers. You are also looking to kind of read their minds though. And this is what I call thinking like the reader. Now first of all, 
when you are writing informational content, this type of article can usually cover a wide variety of different types of subjects and purposes. I've kind of I kind of ran through a number of those a few minutes ago, where you could be using this for answering questions, solving problems, teaching people how to do something, teaching them about an activity, just giving them facts on a subject. There are many, many different possibilities of kind of the kinds of different content and subjects and purposes that this stuff could really be used for. So on one hand, this does make it a little more difficult to write this kind of content in a predetermined way because ultimately each topic kind of needs to be approached individually. Each topic is unique. Each topic may be looking for something different and so you really need to think about the subject that you have for any particular article and think about how you can break that subject down into different parts maybe into different steps if it's something like a tutorial. So then once you have analyzed the topic in this manner, you'll start to get a better idea of how to write about it in most cases because those different broken down pieces, you can usually just explain them in more detail one at a time organize them in a way that will make sense, that will then explain this main topic by basically explaining a number of different subtopics that have to do with the main topic. So when you're tackling your informational content in this manner, it makes it a little easier to create this content to do the writing. It makes it easier to create more effective articles too though. Articles that are actually going to help people to solve problems or answer their questions or whatever it was that they were looking for. So when you're going through this process and thinking about the main subject of your article before you start writing and you're analyzing that topic to break it down into those smaller chunks ask yourself this question, what kind of information will the readers, the visitors to this page likely be looking to find? And your goal with that article is to try to provide them with that information. Now this also draws into predicting user behavior. A lot of writers think that they basically just have to guess at what their readers are going to want, what they're going to want to see in the article. And while this is kind of true to a certain extent, you can also kind of seem to read the minds of your readers by predicting their behavior. And this isn't real mind reading. What this is doing is you're just taking the information that is available to you and using it to draw reasonable conclusions. And then based on those conclusions, you are incorporating these things in your article. So you can lead the reader to a certain point, and so you can convince them to basically take the next step, whether that's clicking on a link to move to another page of your site or buying a product, whatever the case may be. So when you want to predict user behavior, you need to consider two key components to all of this. The first of them is how are readers going to reach your page? Will people be arriving through search engines? Are they arriving through other pages of your website? Are they arriving through other websites besides search engines? So how are people getting to your article? 
in the very beginning, when you're first creating that article, you don't necessarily know for sure where the people are going to come from. But for a lot of websites, they are generally trying to target search engine traffic. And so that's usually the starting point that I go with. Later on, I could revisit my page. I could look at Google Analytics stats for that particular page and find out for a fact where people are coming from, how they are entering my page. And so the reason why you want to know all of this is because you want to basically provide what people are looking for. And you can kind of figure that out by knowing where somebody is coming from, how they are getting to your article. If they're searching on a search engine and they type in a particular keyword phrase, it's not going to be just some random keyword phrase in most cases that they use to land on your on your web page. It's probably going to be one of the keywords that you have decided to target in this particular article. So you have control over all of this stuff to a certain extent where you're not just going to blindly rely on search engine traffic. You're targeting a number of different keyword phrases. You're targeting a number of different predefined topics that all relate to this one article. And so based on that information, the different keywords that you're going to be targeting on that page think about what kind of information your readers are expecting or possibly hoping to find on your page. And so your goal is again to provide that information to them in an organized way through your article. So number two is what information do you give your readers? This is the second main component of predicting user behavior. Based on the keyword phrases that you decided to target, which leads to the content that you decide to provide to your readers, and then the way you have organized that content, think about where that content is going to lead your reader. They come in your page looking for information on a certain subject. And so once they learn or find that information on your page, ask yourself what is the next logical step for them to take. Are they going to want to learn about a different subject that relates to what they just learned? Are they going to be primed to want to buy a particular product at this point because of the information that they just learned? As an example, if somebody wants to learn how to go hiking in the snow, maybe in the mountains or something like that, your article on that subject can basically break it down to give the relevant information in easy to understand pieces. Once they then learn that information on how they can do this activity that they were wanting to do, a next logical step is that they may simply realize that they're going to need certain pieces of equipment to be able to do that. They might need um, hiking snowshoes and uh, poles or something to go along with it to be able to traverse that type of terrain. So a next logical step in this process would then be to direct them to information about that particular equipment that they are going to need for that specific purpose. So in your article you can accomplish this at the very end of the article in the last sentence or two with a call to action.
and this is basically just a link to another page on your website. And then that next page can be another informational article or maybe even a product review article if you're trying to get them to buy a product. This approach that I've just talked about can basically be used with most informational based topics. It works out for the search engines by giving them the keywords and satisfying you providing information on those keywords. It also helps the readers. It gives them the information that they're wanting to find in an easy to understand way. And it also helps you to accomplish your website goals. This informational content, think of it as a stepping stone in your website funnel, trying to get traffic from point A to where you want them to end up at. So they come in from a search engine, they land on your informational content, they read through it, maybe then they have a link at the bottom that forwards them along to a page to buy a product that relates to that topic. So you're moving traffic along with these informational pages. And next up, I want to talk about brainstorming and outlines. We've kind of gone over these things a number of times already in this series, so I'm not going to spend a ton of time on them today, but it is very important that I mention this stuff because for informational articles especially, I find this process to be really crucial in helping me to create a good article, helping me to address a lot of the key things that people are really looking for having to do with article topic. So before you actually start writing your article, make sure you take some time to brainstorm the topic first. What you're really looking to do is to make a list of all of the key points and main subtopics that you want to be talking about on that page. Once you have this list of all of these key topics that you want to talk about, you then want to see if you need to basically revise the way that you phrase those key points. If you look at your brainstorming list and just go one item at a time and search that topic in Google and in the Google Keyword Planner to try to find a search engine keyword phrase that has any kind of traffic to it is better than a traffic a keyword phrase with no traffic. So you just want to try to find some kind of a keyword phrase to go along with each of these key point or subtopic items on your list or at least as many of them as you can find. Then when you can find these keywords, just revise your list so those key points that you want to be discussing, so they include that keyword phrase. This will give you a much better chance of being able to uh, get some good search rankings on these articles later. So once you have this whole list of your brainstorming topics and then you've kind of integrated the keyword phrases into these topics, you want to turn this into your outline. And your outline is basically just a listing of these different topics that you're going to discuss, but each item in the outline will get turned into bold header text and then you'll write a couple of paragraphs of content below each of those headers. So as long as you thoroughly create your outline and properly organize those subtopics in a way that makes sense, then 
this is really taking care of the vast majority of the work for you. All you then have to do is just go through each of those subtopics and expand on them. Write about those topics. Explain them. Give whatever information you're looking to give to your readers. If for some reason though, if you're dealing with an informational topic that really does not have a clearly defined logical order, consider whether alphabetical order may be the best way to go. Using an example that um, I was using in the previous class with the article that I wrote in class number four uh, at the end of that class. That particular article was um, a category page for different kinds of Nepenthes. On that page, I would then be listing all the different species and linking up to pages for those species to provide more information about them. There's not really a clearly defined order to say list all of those different species in. And so therefore, especially since there might be a lot of them, I may potentially link up to 50 or possibly 100 different species from that one page, alphabetical order will make the most sense for me there. Now also, if you get to this point in the outline and you look at each subtopic on your list, ask yourself whether you can write at least a couple of sentences worth of information about that subtopic. If you can't, you may need to combine some of your subtopics. And then on the other side of that spectrum, if you look at a subtopic and you have a lot to say about it, if you don't think you can adequately cover that subtopic in about four to six paragraphs worth of text, simply think about breaking it up into multiple subtopics so then you can adequately explain each. You simply don't want a massive chunk of article text without having any kind of a header or anything to help break that up to make it easier to read. You also don't want really tiny paragraphs of text with tons of headers. It'll simply make your page look uh, a little skimpy in terms of the content that it's providing. So with that said, when you are creating the content for these informational pages, I'll be walking you through all this when I do the live demonstration here in just a few more minutes. Um, to start, you simply use your outline. As I mentioned, you go through your outline using each subtopic as a header and then you simply write some paragraphs of text down below that subtopic to explain it, to tell readers whatever you need to tell them about it. Once you have all of these subtopics explained for your article, then you basically have two more pieces left to take care of. The first of these pieces is an introduction that you want to put at the beginning of the article. The introduction is basically going to be a summary of that article and you want to be sure to use your primary keyword phrase, preferably in the first sentence, and you also want to make sure you're using numerous semantic keywords throughout that introduction. The introduction um, Usually I aim for somewhere in the neighborhood of about two to four paragraphs worth of text. But ultimately say whatever you know you feel like needs to be said to get people into your article. Tell them what to expect from it. That way you've kind of 
hook them. If, if they were searching for information about something and you restate that within this introduction and make them realize that, you know, there is information in this article that is going to be pertaining to that particular topic that they've been searching for, they're much, much more likely to proceed through your page and to actually read it all. Now the next part, beyond all that subtopic content and the introduction obviously, is going to be a conclusion for your article and this will go down at the bottom. So you have the introduction, then you have your outline with all the explained subtopics, and then you have your conclusion to finish it off. This conclusion should typically be somewhere in the neighborhood of about one to four paragraphs of text. And then at the very end of it, preferably in the last sentence or two, if it makes sense to do so, add some kind of a call to action, which is just asking your reader to do something. What you ask them to do is really dependent upon what your article is about, what you think their next logical step would be, and also what your website goals are. Why do you want this traffic on your site? Where, where do you want this traffic to go? What do you want to accomplish with this traffic? So then ask yourself, how can I take what is the predicted user behavior from this article and what is it going to lead them to and then how can I take that and transfer it along to help me accomplish my website goals. Will they want to read more information about a subject that before they're going to end up wanting to perhaps buy something? Are they ready to buy something now that I could send them along to take a look at now. Ultimately, when this conclusion targets this predicted user behavior, it makes sense. It makes sense to your reader. It makes sense to search engines. It will also help you to accomplish the goals of your website. So again, this call to action at the end, it's just a way to encourage the traffic to proceed on to that next logical step. You don't want them to finish your article and to be lost or to feel like they're done with your website. You want them to stay on your website until you are able to convince them to complete one of the goals of your website, such as buying a product. So for most informational articles, these readers will be primed for learning about something else relating to that subject or about learning about a product relating to that subject that they were just reading about. So as long as you create on your page, on your, uh, create a page on your website about that next step that you want them to take, it's a really easy way to forward them along to it. You just link up a couple of words in one of those final sentences to that next page that you want them to continue on to. Whenever possible, think about the keywords you're trying to target on that next page and use that keyword phrase to link that page in those final sentences. It makes sense for readers, and it also will help you with search engine rankings too. Now one final thing that I want to mention here is an in-page menu. Some informational articles can simply end up being quite large. If you have a really long article 
generally I, I might use 2,000, 2,500 words or so as the cutoff, but it's, it's not an exact science or anything as far as that word limit. It's really just what makes the most sense for your article. In a lot of cases though, when I'm dealing with a huge article, I assume that I'm going to have information in that article that maybe not everybody will want to read. Maybe somebody is going to land on my page and only be looking for a certain piece of the information that I am offering overall on that page. When you're dealing with a really small page, it's easy for them to find that little piece of information. But when you're dealing with a really large page, it makes that a lot more difficult. So having this in-page menu to help them quickly navigate to certain areas of that page content can help them to overcome that issue. For people that are, are going to want to read your entire page, it can also help them to bookmark a place, for example. They might not be able to read this huge article in one sitting. They might have to stop halfway through and come back to it. So they might bookmark your page and just simply remember, you know, where they were at. And then they can use the menu to kind of navigate back to those places. So these are obviously helpful for your readers, but they're also helpful for search engines that are looking to find certain pieces of information within a really large article. So I have a code generator that would be useful to help you create this in-page menu. This generator, I've provided the link for you in the guidebook for today's class. And this is the content menu generator. Now, to use this on a website, you're going to need to worry about two different pieces. The first one is the CSS coding. This CSS coding, everything that's in this text box, needs to be put on your live website. There's usually a place in most WordPress themes to insert this CSS code. These are the themes that I typically use and teach people to use, and so I explain how to do it with these. But if you're not using one of these, just check out the options for your theme within WordPress and look for a place where you're able to insert code or insert CSS code of some type that will be inserted into every page of the website. You only need to put this code in one time, though, for any of these code generators that you want to use. And then you can use as many different code generators on as many different pages of that one website as you want to. So with that said, once you have that CSS code put into your website, then you just have to worry about providing the information that this code generator, generator is asking you for. The first piece, the menu header text, is just a piece of header text that will um, go across the top of the menu. So right here, this is one of the menus that I have created using this code generator. So this is the header text that will go right here. The next part of this, though, is the HTML menu code. Now, the menu code gets a little more complicated, and this part is something that, unfortunately, my code generator can't really do for you. And there's also kind of two pieces to this. So I want to show you how all this works. 
so you can uh, understand here, so you can incorporate this into one of your own websites as well. Let's say I have this article and I have a number of different subtopics and obviously I'm putting in very short um, paragraphs here to describe each of these and then I have a conclusion within this article if I wanted to create my own in-page menu the first thing I need to decide is what items are going to be in that menu. One of the easiest ways to do this if you're writing based on my training is to just simply use your header text items as the menu items. So people can simply jump down to any of these that they want to. Now if you're dealing with a huge article that has tons of these maybe each of them gets grouped in a certain way into some kind of broader subtopic and then you could just list those but the point here is that you have to decide where you want pe people to be able to jump down to within your article so once you have decided that then you need to add some code this is simple HTML code. It is a div tag with a blank ID attribute right now. In the, um, in the guidebook for today's class, I have it listed like this. What you're looking to do is to take this chunk of HTML code and you want to put it in anywhere the line above anywhere you want somebody to be able to jump to within your article. So I've gone through and I've pasted this above each of my header text lines going all throughout the article. I don't need this uh, top one here. So now I need to customize these IDs the part that says link name here. This needs to be unique and only used one time on the entire page. So I'll typically just name it after the header text that I'm going to be linking up to just to make it kind of easier to understand. So I'll name that the first one intro, then I'll name that one subtopic one and two and subtopic three. And then finally I'll name the last one conclusion. So once you have added this HTML and customized the IDs in your actual article text, then you basically want to have a list of what you just did. So by a list, I'm talking about the menu items that are going to go into this. So your different header text lines, introduction, subtopic one, subtopic two. You want to have all of this information transferred over to another list. doesn't have to necessarily be in a separate page here. I'm just dividing these for uh, clarity purposes in this training. So in addition to the menu items that you need in this list, 
you also need to know these IDs. So for now, I could just go ahead and just kind of add these into my list. So now I have my menu items and I have the IDs that go along with each of those menu items. So now, the only thing I really need to do is to create this menu HTML code. At this point, I am now ready to create this code. This menu HTML code is a list, an HTML list. WordPress helps you to create these lists very easily using the OL, UL, and LI buttons that are up at the top of the generator. If you were to go up to the top of WordPress and click on either OL or UL to start the list, what it's basically going to do is add in an opening and a closing tag for that list, such as this. If you click on LI within a list, it's going to basically add this for you. And so this is your, the UL is the list container, and then the LI marks a particular line within your list. So what I'm looking to do is to create a list with each of these menu items as an item in the list. So I have introduction here. Then I'm going to have subtopic number one. Going down through subtopic number three. And then I will have conclusion at the end. So once I have this HTML list now with each of my menu items in it, I need to turn each of these items into a text link. And these text links are not going to point to another web page or another website. They're going to point to this page, but they're going to reference one of these, these ID tags that came from here. So I want to put a normal link on for each of these text items, for each of these menu lines. This is a basic blank link. The only thing I have not filled out here is the destination of this link. So the destination is going to be a hashtag followed by the ID that you want it to link to on your page. So for the introduction, that's going to be intro. Again, intro is coming from this div tag that I put above the introduction line. So I repeat that same process now. Now my menu is complete, or at least the HTML code for my menu is complete. So each of these menu items are 
an individual list item in this list. An unordered list, which is the UL, provides me with bullet points in front of each menu item. The OL, which is an ordered list, will provide you with numbers. So the first one will be one, the second one will be two. I'll typically use OL with a tutorial or something where there are predefined numbered steps. And then with just any other kind of page basically where the steps aren't really in a numerical order necessarily, then I'll use the unordered list. And sometimes I might even use perhaps a combination of the two. So I take that list that I just created and I put this in here for the menu HTML code. And then up here would be my header text. Whatever I wanted to show as maybe the menu title would go here. And then I just click on generate. And I copy all the HTML code that will come from this. And then I put it in the top of my article. So I copy all this code. I would then go back to my article that I was writing and at the very beginning of everything I paste in that menu now. Then this article gets put into WordPress or whatever your website is. So we're taking just our plain text article and we're kind of adding this extra HTML coding to it to handle this in-page menu. Once you get the hang of these, practice them a couple of times. They're actually quite simple, even though I totally understand that they can uh, look a little daunting at, at first try. I mentioned before that I did a, a combined menu where I use both an unordered list, the bullet points here, and the ordered list, the numbers. If you see here, I have the start of my ordered list, my OL. Then I have a line for my introduction, and then each of these other lines are a line for the ordered list. The unordered list, though, comes in as part of step three. See, it's kind of embedded into step three. These are extra steps, basically, to step three. So within step three, within that li tag, and after my link and my menu item for chamber construction there, I then just start a new list, an unordered list within that li tag before you have that closing li tag. So over here with my menu that I generated, let's say, let's say subtopic number one here, maybe I wanted to add an ordered list to it. I take the closing li tag from the end of that item and I move it down a little bit just to make myself some more room and then I would just start building my new ordered list within that like so and you can have as many of these li's as you want to within this ordered list. So this would, this is how you create these nested lists like you see in, in my menus here. So now beyond showing you the menus here, my other goal for today is to give you a demonstration on writing these informational topics. So for the writing demo for today's class, 
I want to continue on with basically the same writing that I was doing before, where in the class number four, I was writing out a category page for um, the different Nepenthe species for my carnivorous plant website, this one. That particular category page was listing out n a number of different species of these particular plants. So what I want to do today is to write up an article for one of those pages that particular category page would then link up to one of these plant species. Now, I also think this is a good example to use for this training lesson because while I do have a lot of personal knowledge and a lot of experience with these particular plants, I really don't know a lot of the technical details, I guess, that go along with this plant. Like, exactly where does it grow? Um, you know, how, how large can it get? Um, what, what exactly people search for having to do with this particular subject? And so it's these types of things that, um, despite having a lot of knowledge about this subject already, I still need to actually do some research. So I was thinking I might do one of the most famous of all Nepenthes, and that is known as Nepenthes Hamada. Hamada is very well known because of this black part of the plant. This is what's known as the peristome, and usually this peristome is one solid piece, but on hamadas, they are spikes or teeth. Um, this particular one, you can see like how severe and, you know, almost uh, scary looking this, this particular plant can be. These are actually coming from the same plant as this. This is a lower picture though, something that grows lower down on the plant when it's younger. And then these plants vine into the canopies of the jungles that they live in on these mountains. And so these vines can sometimes be 50 feet up into the air. And these are the upper pitchers that are created by it. So this is obviously going to be one aspect of what I would want to discuss. One other possible thing that I could try to discuss is this other variation of this plant that's uh, more recently come into being known about, and that is called the hairy red hamada. And uh, this right here is actually a picture of the hairy red hamada. It's got red teeth instead of black teeth. And it's kind of hard to tell from the picture here, but the pitcher body itself is actually like hairy on this particular plant, but not on the other ones. So I believe this would be another um, good point worth talking about. So as I go through and research this subject and just try to 
find all these different key points about this uh, topic that I really want to be discussing or, or relaying to my people, I just simply make notes about them. Um, I also think that this would be a relevant topic, discovery. Basically this early history type of information that uh, Wikipedia here is providing. I also think this will be a, that discovery topic will be a good one because I do not personally know this information by heart. Um, so when I, when I write about this, I'm going to have to basically rephrase the information here and then put it in my own words in my in my actual article there's also some mention of the Perry variation talk about um, the plant morphology basically I this is this is one area where some people do look for information about this this is not my area of expertise I I can visually identify the vast majority of these Nepenthe species but there's there's a science to identifying plants and this description in in a lot of cases has to do with that kind of information where they just they use a lot of terms that aren't really going to make sense to just the average reader it's like botany type of terms. Some of them I understand, some of them I certainly do not. Like the texture of the leaves here. I'm not going to even attempt to pronounce that because I'll probably butcher it. I certainly don't know what these words mean. I could try to learn all of these words one by one by one, but as you can see there's uh, just the ones that are linked, there are quite a few of them, and there might even be some more in here that I don't quite understand that I would also need to research to be able to truly grasp this concept enough to then be able to write about it in my own article. So, I'm not going to be covering this type of information in my article. And I just simply will not target keyword phrases having to do with this type of stuff. However, I should mention words like this could definitely be considered semantic keyword phrases. When I start using, if I were to write about this kind of stuff, and I used a lot of these phrases in my article, Google would know that I'm talking about plants, for sure, based on all these different words that I'm using to describe the plant in this kind of a botanical description type of manner. So, that is kind of the one drawback, maybe, of not addressing that type of information. But I don't want to provide inaccurate information or provide information that I don't necessarily completely understand myself. And so to avoid uh, basically giving out bad information in that regard, um, a lot of times I'll just opt not to include that information. I talk and focus more on the 
uh, things you know that I actually know about, the things that actually matter to me that I have knowledge on. So with that said, um, in addition to this information that I have here, there are a number of other parts that I'm going to want to have as part of this um, as part of this article. I definitely want to talk about care and cultivation of it. I want to talk about not necessarily talk about, um, but I'm just putting this here just kind of as a reference to myself. At the bottom of this article, my intention is to keep providing new pictures of of these plants. And so people can see, you know, what what size they're likely going to be when they first buy them. And you know, how long it's going to really take the plant to progress to the point where it's making, uh, you know, the pitchers that everyone expects. These really large pitchers with the, uh, the full detail of the plant, it doesn't really exist uh, when the plant is tiny. I don't think they're going to have any pictures here of the of the tiny plants though. But these are all these are all wild plants though. Full grown mature wild plants. And so that's often, you know, a bit of a misconception. How long do the, does it really take for these things to grow up? Most people don't realize it when they're getting into this hobby, but you buy these plants, um this one, this one in particular, they're talking about, one hundred and fifty to two hundred dollars, and it's kind of ranged from about fifty bucks all the way up to maybe three hundred and fifty dollars for this plant. So this is a pretty expensive plant, and when you buy this plant, it's about two maybe three inches across and it can take five sometimes even ten years before it makes these full-sized large pitchers that people are basically expecting to you know get out of these plants and so I think the photos over time section is a uh, something that will that will attract a lot of interest, will help to bring a lot of people into my site, and will also help to keep people coming back to my site over time if they know that I'm going to be updating these pages. Now this also ties into website goals of mine, ultimately. I'm not just blindly giving out this this free content or building these articles on these different subjects solely to try to attract search engine traffic, even though that is certainly a purpose of it. But I'm also trying to accomplish my website goals. I'm trying to refer sales on Amazon products that people need to build uh, environmentally controlled growing areas to be able to grow these plants. And then I'm also slowly uh, moving back into the retail side of this, where I actually import these from overseas and uh, grow them up and resell them. This particular Hamada plant, um, I believe I have about 42 of them at the particular moment. So. I'm not looking to be selling them right away, but I'm going to be growing these up for six months, maybe a year, possibly two years at the most, and then I'm going to sell them. So they're much larger, more beautiful plants. So they actually have pictures on them that look like this because they certainly 
um, look maybe a little bit like this when they're really tiny, but but they're nowhere near as impressive when they get really large, and they sell for a lot more when they get large. So my ultimate end goal in this is I can be transferring people from this Hamada article to actually buying the plant from me in the future. And if they already own the plant, maybe it's not doing very well or something, I might also be able to get those people to buy Amazon products through me because they need a, a better growing environment. So I can teach them how to create that and then show them the products that they need for it. So the purpose of this content is multi-purpose to help me accomplish my, my website goals. I also am building an audience from this. There's a Facebook group connected with this that's got over a thousand members. And so I kind of build up the loyalty, I build up readers this way. So I have a number of these different subtopics now. Um, I have to try to figure out how to arrange these different subtopics and whether or not these subtopics are worthy of being their own standalone subtopic. Like, for example, uppers versus lowers. Once I really think about it, while I could show pictures of up, uppers and lower pictures um, and, and talk about them a little bit, there might not be a ton that I could really say. Uh, and so I'm kind of thinking I might include that in the care and cultivation section. So I'm just going to put a little mark here to let me know that this is within this item. Discovery probably be best done higher up. The hairy red variant can come later on and then concluding with the photos over time So these are going to be my main subtopics here. And ultimately, I'm not really going to be writing about this one, or at least not writing very much about it. I might have a sentence or two that basically just says, hey, here's pictures of my Hamadas and, you know, dates and everything to go along with them so you can kind of see how they progress. So now that I have my brainstorming done and I have my subtopics picked out and organized, the next thing to do is to move on to the rest of my article. So I'm going to switch over now to the third writing blueprint that is included with this series. And again, this is for informational pages. And I'm going to demonstrate how this will work. So, my primary keyword phrase is Nepenthes Hamata. It is often abbreviated as N Hamata or maybe even just plain Hamata. Secondary or semantic keyword phrases. I definitely have care and cultivation. The hairy red variation is certainly going to be a semantic keyword phrase. And then I'm also planning on using some other relevant semantic phrases in this writing. In particular, when I'm talking about where the plants were were found or where they're where they're coming from this kind of stuff I 
want to be transferring all this. So for example, this this Hamada picture is found in Sulawesi, Mount Catopasa. So those would be other semantic keywords. Other semantic keywords would be perhaps the uh, people that that found the species. So Dutch botanist Pierre Joseph Ima. And then there is also um, Chen Li. He discovered the uh, red hairy variant. Now they're also saying that Ganung Lamut, I believe which is probably the source of all plants currently in cultivation. I believe that is, yeah, that's, I know that's incorrect because these, where I get most of mine from, are, um, are from Mount Catapasa, which is uh, what that, what this picture was from. So, uh, there's definitely more than one location that they can be found in. That also that also reminds me that I think it would be worth explaining this. Ganung, I may not even be pronouncing it right, is basically the same word for mountain or mount um, in in these areas, uh, Indonesia, Philippines type of areas. Okay, so here it's telling me that it's um, it's only found on the Indonesian island of Sulawesi, but then there are numerous mountains where where uh, populations of this have been found. So I'm just gonna add. A number of these other mountains to my list here because I may end up wanting to make reference of at least some of of these so now that I have maybe a better idea of the keywords that I want to be going after I am ready to proceed on my final article title is definitely going to be Nepenthes Hamada, but I'm debating what else I could add on to this. I'm going to go with Nepenthes Amata in-depth care and cultivation tips. So continuing on, I have my 
final description. This will be my meta description now for this page. Have, there are hundreds of species of Nepenthes, but in Hamada is quite possibly the most beautiful and well-known of them all. In retrospect, I don't know if that would be the best meta description. It seems more article summary-like to me. I'm going to cut that out and... Uh, Add that on down there. Here I'm saying one of the holy grail plants in the Nepenthes genus, Hamada, can be difficult to grow without the right knowledge about its needs. I could maybe even say, well, I think my title might speak for itself in terms of letting people know that I, you know, am going to be providing that information on this page. If I had used maybe a more vague title, if I just had gone with Nepenthes Hamada for my title, <clears throat> then I would certainly want to maybe give a little more of an explanation in my meta description. For my article summary, this, this I'm technically not going to be needing. I'm not going to use article summaries even on my category page, so I can actually skip this section. This would probably be more for my introduction. So here in my first two sentences, I say there are hundreds of species of Nepenthes, but N. Hamada is quite possibly the most beautiful and well-known of them all. Native only to Sulawesi and Indonesia, this carnivorous plant is best known for its fearsome-looking teeth that line the pitcher peristome. Here I have used one chunk of my keyword phrase, Nepenthes. I have used N. Hamada, which is kind of the rest of it, or a variation of it. And I have used quite a few semantic keywords. Species, Sulawesi, Indonesia, carnivorous plant, teeth, pitcher, peristome. All these are semantic keywords. Now I do need to say a little bit more about what people can expect from 
this particular article. In my next sentence, I say caring for this plant can be easy if you have the right conditions for it, but many growers are confused about exactly what conditions to provide. I have been growing carnivorous plants for more than a decade, so I want to pass along my personal knowledge to help you cultivate these beauties. Again, lacing this content with lots of semantic keywords, but I'm making a point to not say Hamada or Nepenthes over and over and over again. I want to sporadically use those because they're going to be some of my primary keyword phrases. So I want to make sure I don't go overboard with them. So I think that might be sufficient for this particular article for my introduction. So now I continue on with my subtopic heading number one. It is going to be Discovery. Now, after some, after some additional thought on this subject, I'm even wondering whether this hairy red variant wouldn't be best done as a discussion under uh, the discovery heading simply because I do want to talk about the discovery of that plant and that's honestly like probably half of the information that I have to talk about it and so if I do that elsewhere in my article then when I get to the hairy red variant subtopic I might not have enough to really say about it anymore so I'm gonna just incorporate that here. Now, a large part of this discovery section is going to be based on information that, honestly, I, I really don't know all that great. So, I want to look at what is here and essentially try to learn this information and then try to rehash this information in my own words. So, the Penthes Hamada in this uh, top few paragraphs here, Penthes Hamada was first encountered by Western explorers many decades before its formal description and recognition by science. Dutch botanist Pierre Joseph Ima collected herbarium material of this species as early as 1938. This would later be used to designate a type specimen, which is used to formally describe a species of plant. Now, they also get into talk that gets a little confusing here. They mention endentata. I'm not personally familiar with that. Um, it's probably because this happened uh, even a lot of it even before my my time, and um, it looks like it may have kind of been named that or described 
as that. Um, at some point, and it was also referred to as N. Hamadas, apparently, in this uh, other older older journal. So, it basically seems like it basically seems like in 1938 it was originally discovered it was kind of rediscovered in a way through these herbarium specimens um, in 1972 and then basically in 1984 ended up getting formally described It looks like maybe maybe down here they're trying to clear up a little bit of the um, a little bit of the the dispute between these different names and stuff. There's a lot of this kind of stuff that goes on in the Nepenthes community um, because these plants are still being discovered even t today and they're kind of still figuring out all this stuff you know there's never been major money pumped into research of these plants or anything like that so um in a lot of ways they're still figuring things out and so in 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 that regard i also feel like it's important for me to not inaccurately provide that uh, information. So I'm going to try to summarize that as best as I can and still give, you know, the relevant uh, information. It kind of looks like though, even even a little further down here, I'm now seeing that the type specimen specimen of the actual Hamada was collected on Mount Lamut. And they give GPS coordinates and the altitude and everything to describe this species by uh, Turnbull and Middleton. But apparently the the specimen that they collected and submitted for it can't even be found. So, um, <laughs> obviously, this is a rather confusing realm. And so I'm, I'm going to do my best to try to simplify all that for my readers while providing... Uh, the relevant information that that I feel like people would need to know to to kind of understand this species, so to speak. This was discovered by dear Joseph Heimer. I'm just going to say Pierre Heimer.
So this basically resummarizes everything. It was not formally described until 1984. Hmm. I guess technically it was 1983. Maybe it got published in 84. So, in addition to this basic information on the discovery, I I want to talk about maybe some of the locations that these plants uh, can be found. So here I have information uh, right up here about the locations of these plants. Um, So these parts of the articles, I obviously find them to be uh, a little more time consuming. I have to kind of be a little more careful about the, the information that I'm putting into it because I'm obviously having to research the information to try to rephrase a lot of this information. I was just taking a look at the place where I where I typically import my plants from and and looking at the different uh, mountains that they have available. It looks like they just have the two that I'm mentioning Lamut and Catapasa. So here is why this information is relevant. Um, I mentioned where they're found, the couple main mountains that they're found on. There are a bunch of other mountains, but I'm not mentioning them because as far as the growers go, the vast majority of them are probably going to be searching for the locations that are known 
to be a source of some of these plants. So I mentioned that these two particular mountains seem to be the source of nearly all of the hamadas in cultivation. I do have one uh, particular special seed grown hamada. I'd have to go back and check out where exactly that one came from. I guess there's maybe a slight chance that I might have one that's not from those locations, but the vast majority of them are, are coming from one of those two locations. Now, I also want to mention the altitude. I suppose I could maybe hold off on the care and cultivation section though for that part. I think the last thing here that I really need to to mention before I move on from my discovery section is the the hairy variant. I need to say a little bit about about this. This, uh, let's see if they mention where it was found. No? It does not say specifically where Harry Hamada was found. It's quite possible that they may not have even uh, released details on exactly where they found it because there is a lot of wild poaching that goes on on these plants. Um, but it's, but it's saying that it comes from a mountain quite far away from the type locality of Hamada, which is one of those two mountains that I was mentioning before, and shows it has a good bit of geographic variation throughout its range. So, um, personally, I kind of think this hairy Hamada will end up being declared as a different species or um, or maybe that that uh, they're closely related or something but you know split at some point in their evolutionary past to the point where they're now drastically different in this way um, but the basic facts that I want to get across from what I'm reading here and from also what I know about this particular plant is just what makes this different from the normal Hamada and uh, who discovered it and perhaps when it was discovered. That might be about all I'm really able to talk about having to do with this. So I'm going to say
So I think that'll be enough. Basically, uh, relaying that information that I was just discussing with you a minute ago. Telling how he discovered it, um, what it's called, and basically how it is different from, from the main plant. So, that gives me my first subtopic heading here. I can continue on down and go to my second subtopic, which will be care and cultivation. Now under care and cultivation, I basically just want to give people a bit of a rundown on what they need to do to be able to provide for this plant and not kill it and also to help it to thrive and to grow. There are really a number of different factors that kind of revolve around this. To a certain extent, I will be discussing a lot of these environmental factors, I guess you could say, in more detail on, on other pages of my website. And so there may be some points in here where I would basically end up cross-referencing other pages. Um, for example, lighting. Um, Hamada, the Highlander plant, needs fairly decent lighting power if you're going to be growing it with artificial lighting. Um, but I don't necessarily have to go into extreme detail as far as uh, that kind of stuff goes, but I could reference people over to another page where I do have a lot of that detail. So I'm going to kind of be trying to balance the information that I provide here with kind of the readability of it. And then if people want to learn more about certain subjects, they can always go and learn more about them through other pages of my site. So with that said, I think I first want to talk about the environment. So I start out by saying the environmental conditions of a growing area will determine whether you can successfully grow Nepenthes hamata. Since this plant grows in the mountains and tropical regions of the world, you'll need to be able to mimic the temperature, humidity, and lighting found there. So I'll start with temperature.
Let's say temperature requirements vary from day to night. During the day, you want warm conditions, preferably above 70 Fahrenheit. But you also need to avoid extremes. I keep my Hamadas at a max of 78 Fahrenheit, but they've experienced brief swings in the 80s. Nighttime is where the temperatures really become important though. I say nighttime is where the temperatures really become important. They need to experience a large temperature drop at night, at least 15 Fahrenheit, but preferably 20 or more. My Hamadas get down to 50 Fahrenheit each night. But you also shouldn't ever go below 45. So you need to cool at night, but not too cold. If they ever experience freezing temperatures, they will die in one day. If they ever experience temperatures up in the 90s, maybe even 100 degrees or something like that, it's a pretty good chance they may also die. Sometimes, though, if everything else is right, you can stray outside of these conditions a little bit. But for the most part, people do need to keep their conditions in those ranges. So, the next part I need to talk about is humidity. Humidity should always remain high, but you want it to be lower during the day than at night. Aim for 70% during the day and 95% at night. Also be sure to provide strong lighting for your plants, assuming you're growing them without an outdoor greenhouse. I aim for around 15,000 lux. Top of the plant height.
And so here I say one final care tip for you involved.